Welcome to the Faith Bridge podcast. I'm here with Pastor Dan, who just brought us a great message in part two of our Blessed series. Let's uh, take a listen now. Well, good morning and welcome to Faith Bridge. I'm Pastor Dan Slagle. I'm so glad that you've chosen to worship with us today. We are in part two of a sermon series that we're calling Blessed. Pastor Ken got us off to a great start last week, helping us understand the biblical concept of the kingdom of God. And it's vital that we understand that concept because it is in the context of the kingdom that we experience blessings. We learn that the kingdom is not a geographical entity. It's not a place, but rather it's a spiritual reality. It's it's a spiritual experience. It's something that we step into, a new way of life, a, a, a spiritual culture, if you will, that is rooted in a relationship with Jesus. The kingdom derives its power from the king, and we experience blessings as we move into the kingdom and form a relationship with the king. Perhaps uh, the clearest biblical explanation of the kingdom is found in a portion of scripture commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount. That's found in the book of Matthew, which is the first book of the New Testament, in chapters 5 through 7. And this morning we're going to be reading in chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, if you want to go ahead and turn there. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one and That can be your Bible to keep, just like Katie got to keep hers. Before we uh, jump into the Word, though, let's, let's take a minute and pray together. Father, thank you very much for the privilege, the freedom, the opportunity that we have to gather here without fear, to lift up the name of Jesus and to worship you in the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray now that, uh, just as you promised, your Spirit would come to be our teacher, and to guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus provides for us eight characteristics of kingdom life. They are commonly referred to as the Beatitudes. They can be divided into two groups of four. The first four Beatitudes have to do with what it means to become a citizen of the kingdom. How does one go about moving from the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of God? And that's what we want to look at this morning, the first four Beatitudes, Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now, it would not surprise me to learn that uh, having just read those verses, some of you might be thinking to yourselves, okay, so in order to move into the kingdom of God, I've got to be poor, I've got to mourn, I've got to be meek, I've got to be hungry and thirsty. That, that's what we're talking about? That, that's what constitutes the blessings of the kingdom? Yeah, maybe not. Maybe I'll take a pass on that. That doesn't sound like a culture I'm all that eager to step into if that's what it's all about. And I can understand that perspective. I I, I know what it's like to step into a culture with which you're not familiar and feel very out of place, very uncertain. This happened to me some years ago when I made my first trip to the Philippines. When I go to visit a new country, I like to take a period of time and read as much as I can about that particular country and culture just to learn how they do things there so I'm not completely off balance when I arrive. And I particularly like to read up on the food because, you know, the missionary credo is where you lead me, 
I will follow what you feed me, I will swallow. And I want to be prepared for whatever is going to be put on the plate in front of me. Well, in my reading, I came across a particular uh, Filipino delicacy known as balut. If you're not familiar with balut, uh, it, it's an egg. It can either be a, a chicken or a duck egg. And um, inside of the egg, the little bird, the little chick or duckling has actually begun to form. You, you've got a critter in there. And what they like to do is uh, you know, take off the top of the egg, crack open the top of the egg, and then just slurp the little bird right in, a crunchy, tasty little treat. I thought I was gonna hurl just reading about it. And uh, thought to myself, okay, should the word balut come up, I'm gonna find some reason to leave the room. Well, I land and my host, Isaias Katorse, wonderful friend, uh, picks me up at the airport. This is the first time I'd met him though. And he begins to inform me on the itinerary for the week, where I'll be going, who I'll be teaching and so forth. And he said, now to begin the week though, we've got a special meeting with our bishop and with several pastors. And uh, we're gonna have a, a big banquet there. And you'll be seated you know, at the front. And we are going to let you have the first honorary balut. Oh, <laughs> gotta be kidding me, man. And that turkey let me live with that knowledge all the way right up to the time of the, of the banquet. And just when I think I am going to have to somehow force this down, he bursts out like, ah, we love to do that to you Americans, you know. <laughs> funny, real funny. Not every aspect of every culture is appealing. And so I, I would understand if you begin to read the description that Jesus provides here of what it means to come into the kingdom if those sorts of thoughts of poverty and mourning and meekness, hunger and thirst, if they don't appeal to you. But before you write it off, I want to tell you a story. And I think in the telling of the story, you will come to see that these things really do lead to blessing. That the values of the kingdom are upside down from what we're used to. And they take us to places that we never imagined Prior to 1994, I had the world by the tail. I mean, I had my act together. I was on cruise control. I was a regular know-it-all. Nobody could tell me anything because I already knew it all. I was a Bible college graduate, a seminary graduate. I'd been ordained into my denomination. My ministry career was on the fast track. Everything about my life was moving forward, and everything about my life was just as I wanted it to be until 1994, because that was the year that my marriage fell to pieces, and I went through a divorce, and that was not something that I had ever thought would be a part of my life. It had certainly not been in my life plan. And as I sat there in the rubble of my carefully constructed, perfect, know-it-all life, I began to see for the first time just how truly unimpressive, how morally bankrupt and spiritually impoverished I was. You see, when you're living in the illusion that all is well, and that you're something special. It's easy to be blind to the truth, but when it all comes crashing down, it can't be denied. There it was. I was just a phony. I was a mean, angry, unchristlike follower of Christ, pastor, no less. And as layer after layer of this false 
world that I had built was being peeled away. There was really nothing left for me to do but mourn my poverty. I was coming to the stark realization that not only was I poor, but I could not do anything about it. I was powerless to fix myself. I was broken beyond repair. And I can't tell you how many tears I shed in counseling afterward, coming to grips with me, coming to grips with the fact that I wasn't anything special and that I couldn't fix myself and I couldn't deliver myself out of my poverty. It was an incredibly painful but also necessary experience for me to move through because that was the beginning of my transition into the kingdom. Prior to that, I thought I was living there, but now I was truly beginning to step in to the kingdom. And one unexpected blessing that came my way was a newfound meekness in my life. I, I no longer felt the inclination to be puffed up about anything because I was beginning to see I didn't have anything to be puffed up about. There was nothing special about me. And coming to that realization was one of the most liberating moments of my life. Up until then, I had not realized how enslaved I was to trying to convince myself and all the rest of the world just how great I was, how special I was. And to finally be set free from that ball and chain and come to a place where I was free to be able to say, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Could you please forgive me? To be set free from the overwhelming need to always get my way. That was a blessing that doesn't have a price tag. I was able to step into a place of meekness because for the first time I was able to look around and see, ah, oh, we are all in the same boat. You see, when you're living with the illusion that you're special, you're in your own little boat. And too bad for the rest of humanity out there. They'll just get by the best they can. But when it all falls apart, or at least when the facade is removed and you see life for what it truly is, you begin to see there's nothing special about me. There's nothing special about anybody else. We are all broken. We are all poverty stricken. We all need to mourn our sad estate. We're all in the same boat. And that set me free to be loving, to be patient, to be kind, because my expectations were no longer out the roof. I hadn't set myself up here so high that nobody else could reach. No, I understood we're all in this together. Without a doubt, here in the United States, we have hands down the most sophisticated and orderly traffic system in the world. Now, I realize that some of you that commute down 290 and I-45 may find that hard to believe. But trust me, compared to the rest of the world, our highway system, our infrastructure, our obedience to the laws it really set the United States apart when it comes to the moving of vehicles from one place to another. On the other hand, in the nation of India, there is the most chaotic, bizarre, inexplicable traffic system ever known to humanity. It's a nation of 1.4 billion people, four times as many people as live here in the United States. But they have an infrastructure that will never, ever, ever catch up 
to all of the people and all of the transportation needs of that country. I mean, Stubner Airline would be considered a major artery, a major highway in that country. And on the roads, there is every imaginable motorized and non-motorized vehicle, cars, trucks, rickshaws, auto rickshaws, and there is also every imaginable, I mean, a literal menagerie of wildlife on those roads, a proliferation of cows and horses and donkeys and camels and yes, even the occasional elephant coming down the road to meet you, which it is advisable to get out of the way. (laughs) Now here in the US, where it's orderly and sophisticated and head and shoulders above everybody else, we have the highest incident of road rage of any nation in the world. We are literally willing to shoot somebody because they don't measure up. I've been to India 20 times, and in all of the chaotic, bizarre mess of that place, I have never seen one incidence of road rage. Not one. Traffic lights are strictly optional. The the direction of traffic, what side of the road you're on, take your pick. (laughs) But nobody gets upset. It just all kind of flows somehow, some way. Why? Because they realize we're all in the same boat here. We're all stuck in this mess together. There's no reason for me to think that I'm somehow special. And of course, American drivers all think they're special. That's a lot what it's like in coming to a place of meekness, of realizing I don't have anything on you. I'm free to love you, to serve you, to be a kingdom person for you. Now, there are many among us, typically those of us of the male persuasion, who recoil from that word meek. Because in our culture, meek means weak. And everybody knows that nice guys finish last. And weak guys get trampled on. And that's not how you climb the ladder. That's not how you get ahead. That's not how you provide for your family. That's not how you make your mark or make a name for yourself, not by being meek. But remember, friends, we're not talking about 21st century American culture. We're talking about kingdom culture. And the values and the priorities of the kingdom are upside down from those of the world. There is strength in meekness. Why? Because when a person is biblically meek, they can choose. You may have the power, the strength, the capability, the wherewithal to do whatever you want to do, but because you've given your allegiance to the king, you're free to do what's best for somebody else. You're free to serve. You're free to set your priorities aside, your agenda aside. You have that capacity, that God-given, spirit-empowered ability to choose to put your agenda off to the side and serve someone else. You don't have to use whatever is available to you. One of the most stark examples of meekness, physical meekness, that I think I've ever seen took place when I was in my late teens. My mom decided it was time for us to have a family portrait. The studio was on about the sixth or seventh floor of a local office building, and uh, I come from a pretty big family. So we, we all gathered there in the lobby of the office building waiting to get on the elevator. The doors open, and we step on, and who should be standing there already? None other than Andre the Giant. Seven foot four, 400 pounds. I mean, a massive, massive human being. It was almost terrifying just to stand there because you realize he could just reach out and you'd be done in an instant. Well, the elevator starts to go up miraculously with all of us and him. Get to about the third floor and he needs to get off. And in his broken uh, French English, he, he says, pardon me, I'm so sorry, could I slip by to get out here? Andre the Giant, can I slip by to get out? I mean, there's never been a Slagle over six feet tall. He could have just (laughs) grabbed all of us at one time, you know, and 
But he didn't do that. He didn't have to. He didn't have anything to prove. Meekness. Can I slip by? Meekness is strength in the kingdom. God was leading me from a life of lies to the life of the truth. And first he had to get me to a place where I realized and understood just how broken I was and to mourn that truth. And out of the resulting meekness that flowed, I discovered something else that was taking place in my life. Suddenly there was a hunger and a thirst within me for something else. Whatever I had been taking up to that point no longer satisfied. I needed something real, something lasting, something permanent, something eternal in my life. But Jesus had to shake all the other stuff out of me first. You know, you're not really hungry or thirsty until you're empty. I had to be emptied before that hunger and thirst could begin to well up within me. A hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Now, righteousness, unfortunately, is a word that's fallen on hard times in our culture. We tend to associate it with self-righteousness, spiritual snobbery, people being overly proud of their faith and wanting to make sure everybody knows what a spiritual person they really are. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Now, when Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled, he essentially is talking about himself. He could have just as easily said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst to be like me, for they shall be filled. Because Jesus is the essence of righteousness. Blessed are those who love unconditionally and think the best of others. Blessed are those who serve sacrificially. Blessed are those who forgive quickly and fully. Blessed are those who care for the needy and the poor. Blessed are those who take up the cause of those who need justice. That's the kind of righteousness that Jesus is talking about because that's the kind of person that Jesus is. Jesus is others oriented. And what he's calling upon us to do to become full-fledged members of the kingdom is to shed ourselves of all of the baggage we've picked up along the way, empty ourselves and make ourselves receptacles open for him to live his life out through us. That's kingdom living. So how does one go about doing that? Well, I think there are two parts to making the movement into the kingdom. There's a a vertical aspect and and a horizontal aspect. And the vertical aspect, of course, has to do with our relationship with Jesus. Did, Did you happen to notice the beautiful progression that Jesus provides for us in those first four Beatitudes? how it begins with the recognition of the poverty of our souls and the need we have to mourn that and to own that and to take responsibility for that so that we can come to a place of humility and weakness and meekness and then hunger and thirst for something better than what we had before. That's the vertical aspect of coming into the kingdom. And that happens when we come before the Lord and we own all of that about us and we say to him, you're what I need. You're what I want. You're the king and I want to be a part of your kingdom. The horizontal aspect of kingdom living has to do with community. A kingdom has more than one person. It has many. We Together we make up the kingdom of God. I need you to be a good kingdom citizen, and you need me. As iron sharpens iron, 
So we grow together, we learn together, we serve together, we become the men and the women that God has created us to be together. There are no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. No, we're designed to do this thing together. If for no other reason than the fact that we're going to be together throughout all of eternity. But primarily it's for the praise and glory of the Father because the Son has delivered each and every one of us from our brokenness and filled us with His Spirit. I want to pray for us. And in particular, I, I want to pray for those of us who are here today, and maybe God is opening your eyes for the first time about this vertical component. Maybe you're recognizing, wow, I'm not who I thought I was. I need Jesus in my life. You're not here by an accident if that's been going through your mind. There's a divine appointment and I want to give you an opportunity to realize that. After I pray, Pastor Ken is going to come up and he's going to take a few minutes and talk a little bit about the horizontal aspect, the community aspect. He wants to share with us a new and exciting way that we can experience community here at Faith Bridge. And I'm going to ask that uh, we remain in a spirit of prayer and worship as we move through this, that we're respectful of those around us that are perhaps doing business with God. And then let's remain seated as Pastor Ken comes to tell us about perhaps what God wants us to do to participate in the kingdom. Won't you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for establishing a kingdom and thank you for inviting the likes of us to be a part of it. And I want to pray right now specifically, Lord, for any person here whose eyes are beginning to open, who's beginning to understand the poverty of their own soul and the desperate need they have to let you fill them. If that's you... All you have to do right now is thank God for his great love for you and let him know, I want you. I want you more than I want this world and all that it has to offer. And you can trust him to fill you just like he filled me and countless others before. Don't let this moment pass you by. But open your heart and step into the kingdom this day to receive blessings that can only be found in the kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen.